The Bain Free Radio Hour. On the podcast, advice on how to shake that pirate booty before a Kazen adds yours to his ear collection. Airship fistfights and brewing planetary revolutions, plus part six of our complete audiobook serialization of Larry Correa's Hard Magic. All right now. Welcome to the Bain Free Radio Hour podcast. It's an honor to have you along. I'm Bain editor Tony Daniel. This time we talk to Australian authors Hal Colbatch and Jessica Q. Fox. They have written a book set in the Man Kazin universe, the Man Kazin Wars universe, the setting for Bain's long running anthology series, the Man Kazin Wars series, created by Larry Niven. This book is Treasure Planet, and Hal will clue us in on the Man Kazinness of it. It's an excellent adventure tale with a winning protagonist on an interplanetary quest, so that will be coming up. And we continue with our complete audiobook serialization of Larry Correa's Hard Magic. It's read by Bronson Pinchot. But first, Laura Haywood Corey joins me for the news. Hey, Laura, the May hardcovers are out. Yay! These include uh, the new Leary and Mundy science fiction novel from David Drake, The Sea Without a Shore. In this one, Leary and Mundy travel to a planet on the verge of a war that might embroil the known galaxy if it gets out of hand. Uh, we talked to David Drake about The Sea Without a Shore in our previous podcast, if you remember. Yep, and also out is a signed hardcover limited edition of Michael Z. Williamson's libertarian science fiction classic, Freehold. That's his first novel. And we're going to be talking with Mike soon on the podcast, right? Yeah, I uh, interviewed him today, and I have to edit that interview. So, believe it or not, Freehold has never gotten a hardcover until now. He was telling me how uh, he was signing all those uh, hardcover insert pages that, that are now the front page of the book. Yep, every hardcover now has a nice uh, signed sheet by Michael Z. Williamson right there in it. And also out in original trade paperback this month is previously mentioned Treasure Planet by Hal Colbatch and Jessica Q. Fox. This is a standalone novel set in the universe of the Man Kazin Wars series, created by Larry Niven, and written by two of that series' most prolific authors. Those are the May hardcovers and original trade paperbacks, or original trade paperback. Yay! And they are now booksellers everywhere, so check them out. I want to welcome Hal Colbatch and Jessica Q. Fox to the podcast. Hello, Hal and Jessica. Hello. Hello. Hal Colbatch is an Australian writer, journalist, editor, and lawyer with a wide range of publications. He's a longtime series author in the Man Kazin War universe, with many appearances in the popular anthologies helmed by Larry Niven. He's created several original characters, including Dimity Carmody, uh, Nils Reikerman, and Vermar Ritt, the uh, Kazin, several of whom also appear in Treasure Planet. And Jessica Q. Fox is an engineer with a major in stochastic, stochastic control. Might want to tell me how to say that at some point. She has had four other books published. Uh, what the Q stands for is a closely guarded secret, one assumes. Is it still guarded, Jessica? Definitely still guarded. <laughs> All right. There's something very familiar about both the title and opening to Treasure Planet. Um, how closely does the story relate to Robert Louis Stevenson's Treasure Island? Would somebody who knows the oh. Stevenson book recognize much of the book? Yes, I think I think anyone who did um, know Treasure Island, and most people do, would recognize quite a bit of it, although it's uh, probably three or four times longer. So uh, obviously there are a lot of different incidents, and um, Treasure Island is set in the West Indies in the 17th century, and this is set in space. Do you know Larry Niven and Jerry Pornell's book, The Moat in God's Eye? Yes, of course. Yeah, well, I think they set out to write the um, the ultimate in um, alien contact stories. I suppose we set out to write the ultimate in um, 
treasure hunt stories. Well, you came close for a science fiction story. It's a really a uh, riveting book, and it uh, you know moves well, a lot of really... that's got to do with Jessica. She's got much more of a uh, uh, science background than I have. Sure. I've picked up a bit, but she's she's more the professional. Well, of course, as with all these things, when the the boy is the hero, you have to solve the problem of what to do with the parents. But we've we've done that as Robert Louis Stevenson did. It was having the Stevenson. Uh... The Stevenson plot there uh, helpful, or did you did you use it? Did you work off of it, or did you? Um... Uh, no, well, uh, no, I wasn't referring to it all the time. I mean, I I read the Treasure Island as a child, and I know it more or less by heart. Mm -hmm. um, and I, it, it was there in my mind all the time, but I I don't think I've read it for a few years. And um, dare I say it, and it's. Uh, Perhaps very ungrateful of me to say it in Treasure Island. There are one or two inconsistencies. You don't say, yes. Right, so the ship keeps changing. It, it's, I mean, it's big enough to take about 30 people to the um, West Indies, but anchors in two fathoms of water. And I think somebody once puts the helm up instead of putting, no, puts the helm down instead of putting it up, which you can't do. But um, nonetheless, that's... <laughs> As the story goes, it is one of the greatest. Several of the characters have not identical but similar names, except for Long John Silver, who is probably the leading, well, definitely the leading antagonist. Now, Silver's a wonderful character in the book. Um, I think you've, yes. you've, you've realized him uh, to a degree that uh, that's close to what Stevenson had as well. Yes, I think one of the most important things about Silver is that from time to time, just momentarily, he um, reveals he might be a better person than he is. He's not a wholly evil character, is he? He's, no. He's complex. He's a lot like the original John, Long John Silver in yeah. that way. Yeah. I mean, the, the other pirates are obviously just petty crooks who are doomed one way or another, but he's something altogether bigger. Where did the idea for doing this uh, arise? Well, I think it was my idea. I've... Um, you know, Treasure Island in space have been in the man sin wars. There are several books I've noticed that are rewrites of old classics, like the the Asteroid Queen is, I think, a rewrite of Casablanca. The Hall of the Mountain King is a rewrite of the Treasure of Sierra Madre, and um, we've done Treasure Planet. Well, this is um, this is definitely set within uh, Larry Niven's uh, man Kazin war universe. You you and Jessica have written other stories set within that universe as well. Yeah, I look, when you've got, I don't know, probably more than half a dozen writers of doing these stories, you won't get total consistency, I'm afraid. That's, uh, that's trying for the impossible, but we've tried to keep it as consistent as we can. So did this did the Treasure Planet arise out of some of those stories that we've seen in the uh, in the anthologies? Not really. I mean, once you get um, once you get the idea, it practically writes itself. Well, you know, uh, Treasure Island, I think, is the epitome of treasure hunting stories, and so we wanted to translate it to the epitome of treasure hunting stories in space. Martha is a completely new character. There's no one like her in um, the original Treasure Island. Now, where did she come from? Well, she's a Zin princess. She's um, Weimar Reed's granddaughter, and while most Zin females are unintelligent, she has uh, um, implants that go into her system to make her intelligent. The Zin bred intelligence out of females many centuries before, and the human, except for a very thin secret stream of intelligent females, and the humans are now trying to recreate intelligence in, in Zin females with, um, as I say, treatments. And there's a real danger that uh, if Martha doesn't, if, if her drugs get cut off for some reason, she she might revert to that. Uh... Yes, that's right. But she's a really, she's a wonderful uh, heroine and a great foil for Peter, our, our sort of viewpoint character. Uh, Jessica, you want to chime in on Martha? No, no, I just think she's a fantastic character and... Um... She's, she's just a good character to put up against Peter. He's an ordinary lad, and she's one who challenges him. 
uh, but she doesn't think entirely like a human, as you may have noticed. She's a lot more, yeah. in some ways. The troubles of, with writing a lot about the man Zin is, is a temptation to make the Zin too human. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you've got to keep, uh, well, I've you know, had to keep pulling myself back and say, no, these, these are aliens. They, they think differently. There are occasional points, there are points of contact or no, or no story would be possible, or no interaction would be possible. But um, as I say, there's, as, as a writer, I've, I've got to be on my guard to stop it making it just a sort of human in a fur coat. Can Can you set up a little bit about Kazin, the Kazin society, and how it does differ from human society? Because a lot of the book plays around that very fact, especially the beginning, which is fascinating. Uh, a human coming to Peter coming to to know this old crusty uh, Zin captain. Yeah. Zin evolved on another planet, sixty one Ursula Major, I think. They were. Well, big feline carnivores going around in packs. They developed an upright position through having to look over tall grass. They developed hands through having to cling on sliding scree and gravel and climbing mountains. And from the, with the upright position of hands, they developed intelligence. This got them up to about an Iron Age culture, at which point a trading race, the Jotok, discovered them into interstellar race, and they recruited them as mercenaries and bodyguards. And uh, the Zin were quite happy about this and then turned on the Jotok and ate them or enslaved them, with the result that you now have this race of barbarians rampaging through the universe with a technology they would never have reached if they'd been left alone, if they'd just been left to themselves. They conquer... They, wrote, they conquer Wunderland and um, occupy it for, I think, um, 65, I can't remember, 60 odd years until Dimity Carmody finds a way of defeating them by inventing a faster than light drive. Um, Following that, there's a... Dimity is a human. It's a very brutal occupation. They're, 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 the Zin aren't, the Zin aren't so much cruel as indifferent. And if a Zin wants a human farm, it takes it and the, the farmers can starve, uh, more or less. There's a, they're, not, they're not quite that bad, but they're quite bad enough. Um, you know, if, if a boy is herding animals in a wood carrying a forked stick and a Zin is in a bad or aggressive mood, he might take the forked stick as a weapon and um, challenge the, the lad to a death duel. Um, so, you know, it's, it's a pretty terrifying life. Every human must abase <laughs> themselves before the humblest Zin. And uh, after the liberation, there's a good deal of hatred and vengeance and reprisals. But by the time of our story, that has... Um, moderated a great deal. And there was a, a human collaborationist government under the Zin, and um, a lot of them have been hunted down. The uh, loyal humans hate them worse than they hate the Zin. The judge in Treasure, um, Treasure Planet is a former collaborator police chief, in, um, and his previous story was his sergeant's honour, in Man's in Nine, which tells how he escaped from vengeance after the liberation. Now, does it, he also appears in Man's in Fourteen as well, I believe, in, in the lead novella. Yes. He, he's a wonderful character yes. in the way that he's, yes. he's sort of changed. Well, what's gradually happening, and this is unique in the universe, is that humans and Zin are setting up a, um, a sort of commensual relationship. I mean, in the next book we've got, uh, you get the Zin are starting to get political power. And, and you get the Zin and humans running Wonderland together. Mm -hmm. Well, what, uh, and, and Zin are, uh, they're just physically much larger than humans. And they're, it, at one point oh, yes. in the book, you say they could take out 40 human warriors. One Zin is worth 40 warriors, something like that is the equation. Yes, and they're much faster. But there's this wonderful friendship between Peter and Martha that uh, has developed in its uh, in the book, and, it, and the book turns on this friendship in many ways. 
Yes. There is another planet, Sheath Claws. This is a, a different story arc, which is dumbbell. It's an island, and it's, it's dumbbell-shaped. And one of the dumbbells the Zin have got, and the humans have got the other, and they also live together fairly peacefully, but much more apart. They each have their own governments that um, get together to discuss matters of mutual interest and things. So that's, once again, is humans in cooperation, but of a different sort. The whole style is different. Well, the treasure of Treasure Plant, we don't want to give too many spoilers here, but it, it has to do with aliens and uh, the ability to communicate or at least uh, yeah. de decode alien uh, alien messages. Can you speak a little bit to how that could happen, how species prospectively could figure well, each other I'll, I'll out? Just see, one of the difficulties about a treasure story in space is what is valuable. I mean, uh, the Zin like gold as much as anyone else because it's pretty, but um, you can make gold or in you with know, modern um, science and or, uh, the, modern, the science of the 25th century or whenever you can you know, make it without too much trouble it's, hard, it's hardly worth going after a treasure for it so the treasure can't be something that's, that, super, that advanced technology can't simply manufacture mm -hmm. and um, so the treasure is in the form of knowledge I suppose we could say that the first thing that shows up is this this box that um, that has various solids in it, and uh, our our characters figure out that this is uh, something from an alien uh, alien world. But there's a a similarity in that the uh, in that uh, yes. every, everybody's got platonic solids. I guess is that correct? Yes. And this sets them off, uh, attempting to uh, to find the treasure. Yes. As well. Yes, well, I think you know the, one of the justifications of writing science fiction at all, and there are a number, but one of them is to be able to evoke an alien atmosphere. You know, what, what would it really be like to visit a, a strange planet and uh, to interact with strange other species? Tell us a little bit about the collaboration process. Um, how did you guys uh, originally start working together? Um, well, I began the story. I think I, I had the original story, Treasure Island in Space. Then I wrote a bit, and Jessica wrote a bit. Then I wrote a bit more, and she wrote a bit more. <laughs> and um, then yeah. we, we went over it together. I have, since the book's been published, I'm ashamed to admit I've, I've seen one mistake got by, but I, I won't go into that. Um, <laughs> I have done collaborations before, especially with Matthew Harrington. Mm -hmm. In both those cases, I wrote half the story and then I ran out of steam and uh, couldn't think what was going to happen next. And he, he wrote the rest and did an extremely good job of it. So the planet Wonderland, there's a, there's kind of, I felt there's an Australian vibe there. It felt sort of like a, a Australia on in the Alpha Centauri system. Did I misread this, or is there something, uh, some sort of... Well, it's, it's, uh, it's meant to have been settled by a German consortium, actually. Um, most of the uh, German English, there's the Tutis, Teutonics, and the Tommies, who are English, plus a few others. There are, um, some of the Japanese criminal gangs got there. Um, the as is told in the first story one of mine, One War for Wonderland, the Vatican sent a spaceship with some priests and monks on board to set up a church. If, if, it, if it sounds Australian, that wasn't um, conscious on my part. Maybe it's the Australian landscape working through my writing. There are settled areas, but there's still very much a wilderness uh, of feel to, yeah. to the land that uh, not everything is known about Wonderland yet. That's right. Well, it's, um, it had of high technology when the Zin arrived, and that's been knocked back a couple of hundred years, which also means that someone like me is not too out of the depth in dealing with it. <laughs> you know, it's got some very lethal uh, lethal fauna as well. I think the less locks and such. Uh, the beams, beasts, and the zytomers. And, um, <clears throat> excuse me, it's also got very big caves, or it did have, uh, because it's got a lighter gravity than Earth, and therefore you don't get the caves' roofs collapsing. You had the Morlocks living in the caves, which were 
named after H.G. Wells Morlocks in the Time Machine, and then from that are the sort of pun, the less locks, which were smaller Morlocks. Mm -hmm. yeah, the, yeah, the Morlocks are, you don't want to come up against, without a Zen by your uh, side. <laughs> no. So you mentioned something that sounded like you're, you and Jessica are working on a sequel. Are, are we going to see a sequel to Treasure Planet? Yes, about what's going to be done with the treasure. Is it going to mostly take place on Wonderland, or are we...? No, it's um, all over the galaxy, I think. Ah. So more adventure is in store. Well, the book is Treasure Planet by Hal Colbatch and Jessica Q. Fox, a novel set in the Man's End Wars universe created by Larry Niven. Hal and Jessica, thank you so much for being with us today. Well, thank you. Thank you very much for having us. And now here's a special treat. This is a song from Bane's Slushmaster General, that is, Bane editor Gray Reinhardt. It's called Another Romulan Ale, and it's from his Truth, Lies, and Make Believe album. Some people swear by mother's milk for nutrition and a buzz. A nasty little throwback to the beer on earth that was. Some folks go for synthahol to avoid intoxication But they will never know the joys of my preferred libation Bring me another Romulan ale Its social lubrication leads to my inebriation And the relaxation of my inhibitions without fail I'd like another Romulan ale Bring me the brew that's bold and blue Call all the crew with just me and you For another Romulan ale You know I tried a little Tranya But it didn't have much kick And the taste of Klingon blood wine Made me very, very sick The time I tried Ambrosia Was a planet-scale disaster But it still rates higher than The pan-galactic gargle blaster Bring me another Romulan ale its social lubrication leads to my inebriation And the relaxation of my inhibitions without fail I'd like another Romulan ale Bring me the brew that's bold and blue Call all the crew and just me and you for another Romulan ale Oh, when it's cold outside It's great to have the warmth of butter beer And I'd love to try an end draft But you cannot get that here Perfect pick-me-up is a shot of Elvish Miravore And I really feel at home whenever the fire whiskey's poor But I'd like another Romulan ale Its social lubrication leads to my inebriation And the relaxation of my inhibitions without fail Bring me another Romulan ale Bring me the brew that's bold and blue Call all the crew with just me and you for another Romulan ale. You know sometimes it's Saurian brandy And sometimes it's Vulcan port Sometimes it's Aldebaran whiskey When you want a little snort Sometimes it's really ancient scotch That you hold in high esteem And sometimes you don't know what it is All you can say is that it's green But I'll take another Romulan ale. Its social lubrication leads to my inebriation And the relaxation of my inhibitions without fail Bring me another Romulan ale Bring me the brew that's bold and blue Call all the crew with just me and you for another Romulan ale Oh, bring me the brew that's bold and blue Call all the crew with just me and you for another Now, here is part six of the complete audiobook serialization of Larry Correa's Hard Magic, as read by Bronson Pinchot. This portion of Hard Magic is provided by Audible.com. Get the complete audiobook at Audible.com now. If you're not a subscriber, you can get the entire audiobook free, or choose from more than 100,000 other titles when you try Audible free for 30 days. Here's what has gone before. 
It's the 1930s in America, but it's an America that has been magically changed. A handful of people from all walks of life have been visited with special magical talents. These people are called actives. They come with different abilities. Some are brutes, able to wield impossible strength. There are finders who can locate just about anything or anyone given time. There are summoners, healers, torches, weathermen, and heavies. Those who can manipulate gravity itself. Most actives use their powers for good, but some don't. One man who can confront power that's been twisted to the wrong side of good and evil is Jake Sullivan. He's a former soldier, an ex-con, and he's an active heavy. He's also a private investigator in a dark and dangerous world. At the moment, Jake is chasing rogue actives who have fled into the sky, hiding on an airship high above the earth. There, he's about to face powerful magic and a splat at the bottom of a long scream if he can't overcome them. Here is Bronson Pinchot with part six of the complete audiobook serialization of Larry Correa's Hard Magic. Lights out, hands, Sullivan said as he crawled over the railing and dropped into a crouch on the steel catwalk. The German was out cold, flat on his back, one leg dangling off the edge. Sullivan knelt next to the unconscious man and patted him down. No papers, no wallet. The only thing distinctive was a gold ring with a black stone on his right hand. Sullivan found a diminutive little thirty-two in the man's coat and frowned as he examined the baby browning. Europeans, he muttered, stuffing the tiny pistol in his own pocket. The German moaned, so Sullivan grabbed a handful of shirt with his left and gave him another big right before dropping him back to the deck. He wouldn't be going anywhere for a while. Now we're even. The big man moved quickly down the catwalk. Through the portholes, he could see that the lights were on inside the cabin, which meant that he could see in, but they'd have a darn hard time seeing out. But he didn't see anybody as he passed. The dirigible was going even faster now, and the wind was screaming past, whipping his tie and coat behind him. Sullivan leaned into it and plodded on until he found an entrance door and ducked in. The door opened into a wood-paneled hallway that bisected the cabin. It was a lot quieter inside. Sullivan paused, catching his breath, dripping rainwater, and made sure his power was ready. The cut on his calf burned, but didn't appear to be as deep as he'd originally feared. The blood was leaking rather than pumping, and he removed his tie and wrapped it around the cut as a makeshift bandage. Once he caught Delilah, the feds were definitely going to have to spring for a new set of duds. He drew his colt and proceeded slowly down the hall, boots squeaking slightly. The next door was marked Galley. Sullivan moved inside. The rectangular space was filled with two long bars and bolted-down swivel stools, but empty of people. There was a door at the far end, and Sullivan started toward it. Somebody was driving this blimp, and he had to be in that direction. Delilah was probably with him, and if he could capture her, then he was finally a free man. There was a tinkle of glass and a crash from the other side of the door, and Sullivan automatically raised the colt. A head moved on the other side of the circular glass window, and then the door swung open. It was a young man, tall and thin, with disheveled brown hair and a skinny mustache wearing a wool overcoat, but no hat, and his tie was undone. He had a bottle of wine in one hand and a corkscrew in the other. He was grinning, and all of his attention was on getting that bottle open. Of course alcohol was illegal, but everybody knew that the passenger blimps always had something good stashed for the rich passengers. Hey, Sullivan said calmly. The 1911 made an audible click as the safety was moved into the off position. The young man looked up in surprise. Hey, yourself, he replied slowly. Who are you supposed to be? The one with the gun, so get your hands up. He paused. But if I do that, I would have to drop this. Sullivan nodded slowly. Beats getting shot in the face. 
This is an 1899 vintage Merida Clarabu. I can't drop it. Well, I could drop you instead. He sighed in resignation. Fine. He let go of the bottle and the corkscrew and quickly raised his hands. But there was no crash, no breaking of glass. Sullivan jerked his eyes down and saw the bottle hovering an inch off the floor. The young man smiled. The bottle streaked across the galley at insane speeds, faster than Sullivan could spike, and hit him in the arm as he jerked the trigger. Rather than break, the bottle impacted like a club. Sullivan tried to reacquire his target, but the bottle came flipping around out of nowhere and hit him over the top of the head, and this time it shattered. Shit, he growled as he landed against the bar, alcohol burning his eyes. The colt came up, but pain flared through Sullivan's hand, and he looked down in disbelief at the corkscrew embedded just behind the knuckles of his gun hand. His fingers twitched uncontrollably, and the forty-five hit the bar. He grasped for it with his left, but the gun flew down the bar and disappeared. Damn movers. Yeah, we get that a lot, the kid said. There was a sudden noise as several of the drawers on the service side of the counter slid open. There was a flash of silver and a cloud of knives, forks, and spoons rose over the bar. All of the items turned in the air so that they were pointed at Sullivan. So who are you supposed to be? I'm here to help arrest Delilah Jones for murder, Sullivan said with more calm than he felt as he stared at a particularly large steak knife. He grasped the corkscrew and slowly withdrew it, turning it so as not to pull out a plug of meat, grimacing against the pain. From his understanding of movers, it took a lot of effort to even direct the smallest of objects with any control, let alone whole bunches of them. This kid was good. You a G-man? the mover asked. He was frowning slightly, so it was taking some effort to hold up all those things, but Sullivan had to admit that it was mighty intimidating. Hardly. I suppose I'm a bounty hunter. Sullivan took his time responding. It had to be using up a lot of the kid's power to show off like that. Being flashy was a waste of energy, and everybody had limits. Maybe I'll get a reward for you, too. What's blimp napping worth nowadays? Actually, this is a dirigible. Blimps don't have internal frames. Everybody knows that. You must be the heavy that's working for the feds. Yeah, Sullivan answered, spiking hard. Guess so. Each piece of silverware suddenly gained fifty pounds. The kid gasped as he lost control and the objects crashed down. The kid was at the far end of the bar, which was a little too far for an accurate spike, so Sullivan reached across his body with his uninjured left hand and rummaged through his right coat pocket. You're gonna regret that, the mover shouted. You heavies can only concentrate on one space at a time. Watch this. Then he theatrically spread his arms and every loose object in the room shook. Plates, cups, bottles, trash, silverware, even the stool spun, and the light fixtures pulled against their cords. It's like a thousand invisible hands, bucko. Let's see how you do in the middle of a tornado. Sullivan came out with the Germans thirty-two. You talk a lot. And then he shot the kid in the knee. Ow! The mover screamed as he fell to the floor. Oh, damn! He grasped his leg, and blood came pouring out between his fingers. All of the telekinetic power was lost, and the various objects fell with a clatter. You, you bastard, that hurts. You have to learn to focus through the pain to use your power, kid, Sullivan said patiently. He'd crossed the room quickly and was standing over the mover. You're lucky. I was aiming for your head, but I'm right-handed. He held up his bleeding hand, indicating the corkscrew hole. The fingers didn't want to close. I don't aim so good with my left. The kid gritted his teeth, gathering his power, and a meat cleaver rose from the bar. Sullivan just shrugged, spiked, and the injured man lofted to the ceiling and rebounded off a steel beam in the roof. 
Then Sullivan let gravity return to normal, and the kid fell, crashing in a moaning, broken heap at his feet. Sullivan returned the thirty-two to his pocket. He removed his handkerchief and wrapped it around his hand to stop the bleeding. The white quickly turned red. It hurt like a son of a bitch. He spotted his colt near the kid and picked it up, limping onward. Two down, but how many others were there? Sullivan was feeling woozy. He was losing blood. Had the others heard the gunshot? Would they be waiting for him? He crossed another empty hallway. The control deck was up a short flight of metal steps at the end. The coast appeared to be clear. Sullivan checked his power. There wasn't a whole lot left. He should have just shot the talky mover again and saved the juice. There was only one way in, so Sullivan moved up as quietly as possible for a man of his stature. If he hadn't been so worried about running low on power, he would have given himself the weight of a dainty ballerina and made no noise at all. He set his boot down carefully so the steps wouldn't creak. The space around him was a mass of darkened pipes and shadows. This section wasn't meant to be seen by the passengers, so UBF had saved the money on making it pretty. This end of the dirigible was noisy and vibrating from the front propellers and the wind. It was possible that the pilot of the stolen blimp hadn't even heard the guns. Creeping forward, Sullivan could see a man sitting in the driver's seat. He could just see the back of a balding head. The captain's chair was empty. He went a little further around the corner until he saw a second person, a woman with long blonde hair at the radio operator station. She had her back to him and seemed intent on whatever she was listening to. All points bulletin. The state police are just waiting for the storm to pass so they can get some biplanes up, the woman said. She had a touch of an accent like some of the Eastern European immigrants Sullivan had served with in the first. They think we're heading for Canada. Good thing we had Heinrich kill the spotlights, the driver said. Canada, please. That's like they took Vermont and made a whole country out of it, only more boring and without the good maple syrup. His voice was deep and smooth, almost like a radio newsman. Sullivan couldn't see Delilah, and she was the one he was worried about running into at close range. He stepped into the room and aimed his gun at the back of the pilot's head. The girl at the radio turned and spotted Sullivan. Uh, Danny, we've got company. Sullivan realized she was rather attractive, probably thirty, with her hair bounced up like they were doing in the new color picture movies. There's a large man pointing a colt at you, eh, and he looks mad. The pilot chuckled, but didn't bother to turn. No need to be rude, Jane. Hello there. My name is Daniel Garrett. You can call me Dan. Pardon me for not standing and greeting you properly, but we're at two thousand feet and climbing, and these winds are getting worse. I'm trying to keep from plowing this unwieldy beast into the ground and being the death of us all. Is that a threat? Sullivan asked. Because I can get out and walk. Dan laughed. Oh, no, friend, nothing of the sort. His voice was calming. Sullivan felt like this man was a likable sort, a real reasonable guy. Please lower that gun and relax. I'm trying to drive this pig here, and I could sure use a hand. I'm sure we can work out this misunderstanding. The colt bobbed down. Yes, this was just a misunderstanding. No big deal. They could always sit down and talk it out over a drink. Dan seemed a decent sort. He reminded Sullivan of an old friend, not that he could think of who specifically. The entire front of the cabin was glass, and Sullivan could see nothing but blackness. Then lightning struck, and he could see again. Sullivan frowned. He'd felt this kind of intrusion before, though this one was a lot more subtle, a lot more cunning. You're in my head. The colt came back up. Get on my head, mouth. You're sharp, Dan said. I thought you heavies were supposed to be dimwits. Not all of us. He kept the gun on the driver, but kept one eye glued to the blonde. 
In this crew, he wouldn't have been surprised if she'd started tossing undead flaming grizzly bears at him or something. I don't have time for your games. No kidding, said the girl. You've got a three-inch laceration on one leg, a puncture in your hand, a minor concussion, two injured vertebrae in your lower back, and you've just picked up a nasty cold, though you won't know about that until tomorrow morning. And you really need to quit smoking. Sullivan sighed. I'm going to ask this one time, then I'm going to beat you until I'm bored. Where's Delilah? A painted fingernail tapped his shoulder. Right behind you, Jake. She'd been hiding between the pipes, Sullivan realized as he spiked. But Delilah had already been channeling her power, increasing her strength tenfold as she grabbed Sullivan by the shoulders and slammed him through the duralumin bulkhead and out the side of the airship. Didn't see that coming, Jake thought before blacking out hurtling through the dark night. It was the cold that finally brought him back to consciousness. Jake Sullivan gradually awoke, coughing at the bottom of a hole. He was on his back, soaked to the bone, encased in freezing mud. Water was falling down the hole, splashing him in the face, and every inch of his body ached. He was dizzy and wanted to puke, but he knew that was just the blood loss talking. Not sure where he was or how he'd gotten there, Sullivan pulled himself out of the mud. Roots and bits of rock were stuck in what was left of his clothing. His right hand still didn't want to close, and he was surprised to find that he still clutched the colt in his left, though when he looked at it, found that he only had the badly crushed frame. The slide was just gone. It looked like the magazine had exploded under the pressure and the magazine spring was dangling out the bottom like a half-gutted fish. Jake tossed the ruined colt in the mud with a splash, saddened by the loss of such a good piece. He checked and found that he was totally out of power, utterly drained and feeling unbelievably weak. It took him nearly ten minutes to crawl to the top of the hole, finding purchase on severed roots and bits of leaking pipe. Finally, he crossed the top, where he discovered five splintered railroad ties and one side of a railroad track that had bent into a U before shearing. On top of that was the broken floor of an empty freight car, and above that was a perfect Sullivan-shaped hole through the freight train's metal roof. That's a first, he thought, as he crawled out from under the rail car and rolled onto his back into a puddle. He was in the middle of a train yard. The North American logo was right over his head. He'd fallen 2,000 feet, blasted through a train car, dug an impact crater, and still nothing felt broken. Somehow he'd used up the last of his power unconsciously before impact. He must have gone real dense. He hadn't known he could do that, but then again he didn't routinely fall off blimps. A shape appeared. Looks like we got us another filthy hobo. There was a second voice. I'll fetch my beaten stick. Sullivan grunted. It was going to be a long night. That was part six of the complete audiobook serialization of Hard Magic by Larry Correa, read by Bronson Pinchot. And that's it for the podcast. Thanks to Audible.com. Thanks to Stephen Long, Laura Haywood Corey, and to podcast theme composer Ruth Judkowitz. And a great barrier reef of beautiful but deadly blue ringed octopi dancing a complicated Neptunian jig of gratitude and praise to Hal Kolbach and Jessica Q. Fox, authors of Mankazen War standalone novel Treasure Planet. Please join us next time here at the hammering heart of science fiction and fantasy. And keep reaching for the stars. Bring me another Romulan ale. Bring me the brew that's bold and blue. Call all the crew with just me and you for another Romulan ale. Oh, bring me the brew that's bold and blue. Call all the crew with just me and you for another